Osama bin Laden, the man who ordered the attack on America. 9-11, the trauma of New York. For 10 years, the USA hunts down its public enemy number one and finds him where no one suspects him. He is killed in Abbottabad, Pakistan, on May 2, 2011. Private papers fall into the Americans' hands during the operation. Some of them are published later online. They offer a glimpse into Osama bin Laden's life in his hideout. How he felt and what he thought. How he loved and hated. Osama bin Laden, up close and personal. Abbottabad, Pakistan, a city of 500,000 at the foot of the Himalayas. Abbottabad benefits from a mountain climate and cool summers. June marks the beginning of the season. Affluent Pakistanis from the hot southern regions enjoy the summertime freshness here. And Abbottabad is safe. After all, the Pakistani Army's military academy is based here. Good private and boarding schools equally thrive in this kind of environment. By Pakistani standards, a pleasantly calm atmosphere pervades the city. The district of Bilal town is not the most upscale neighborhood. Despite that, larger solitary compounds dot the area in an otherwise rural environment. None of the residents suspect that one of these compounds houses a man who is wanted all around the world, Osama bin Laden. He once spread fear and terror into the Western world. In his house in Abbottabad, a TV links him to the outside world. Occasionally in newscasts, he sees himself, the man who many regard as the world's most dangerous terrorist. For the Americans looking for him, he has vanished into thin air. In his hideout, he views the videotapes displaying, in his opinion, his greatest triumph again and again. September 11, 2001, the attacks on the World Trade Center in New York, which killed almost 3,000 people. Roughly 10 years later, bin Laden wants to publicly savor his terrible triumph one more time. In his compound, he writes to a confidant. We are awaiting the 10th anniversary of the blessed attack on New York and Washington. You are well aware of the importance of taking advantage of the anniversary in the media. We have a lot to show. If Al Jazeera shows responsiveness, we should tell them that we are willing to cooperate. Tell them that we suggest that they make a documentary on this anniversary and we will provide them with printed, audio and video material. We should also look for an American channel that can be close to being unbiased. Original quotes from bin Laden himself, according to the US government. It has posted 103 documents on a website, materials seized in Abbottabad in 2011, mostly on hard drives. Though bin Laden is very outspoken in these documents, still, they don't reveal how he came across face to face. British journalist Peter Bergen experienced this firsthand. I met bin Laden in 1997 in eastern Afghanistan. It was his first television interview. Um, you know, he came across as um, serious, well-informed, um, very low-key. You know, he was not sort of, I didn't know what to expect. I thought, you know, was he going to be thumping the table and shouting? He wasn't. He was very even. On September 11th, 2001, 
Osama bin Laden humiliates the global power, USA. That same day, he's in a cave in Afghanistan. Sitting among his followers, he keeps count as the hijacked planes hurtle into their targets, one after the other. This is the day when he becomes the most well-known terrorist in the world and the most wanted. It wasn't something handed down to him. Osama bin Laden was born in 1957 in Saudi Arabia, a country marked by old traditions and rapid change. Oil makes the desert nation rich, but big money brings the modern era with it. Consumption and decadence start to compete with the Bedouin's simple life. Osama bin Laden is not among the losers in this change. He is one of 54 children sired by Mohammed bin Laden, a developer who became extremely wealthy as a result of Saudi Arabia's construction boom. A widely branched family, the bin Ladens gain ever greater prestige and influence. It was really quite a, an organized clan. And uh, under Islamic inheritance law, uh, Osama would have known uh, as a recognized son of Mohammed bin Laden that he would, that he would have a, a significant fortune um, after his father died. Like many Saudis of his generation, young Osama loves some of the novelties. Cars are his passion. He enjoys playing soccer, too. In Jeddah, he attends one of the most modern elite schools in the country. Osama's gym teacher at the Al-Taga Model School comes from Syria, where he was a member of the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood. Now he lives in exile in Saudi Arabia. The teacher deliberately tries to influence young bin Laden's political views. So uh, Osama had this very distinctive experience in elite, an elite educational setting, influenced by European curricula, but also educated by Syrian Muslim Brotherhood activists who saw Islam as a source of political change, not just personal faith and practice. Osama bin Laden studies economics and business administration at King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah but he is drawn to lectures held by Islamic scholars. One of them, Abdullah Yusuf Azam, spurs the faithful on to wage jihad, holy war. Muslim soil must be defended against the hegemony of the infidels. The armed struggle to accomplish this ought to be fought throughout the Islamic world. Afghanistan. Here, jihadists literally go into combat against hostile invaders. Soldiers from the socialist Soviet Union have occupied the country. Firm conviction causes many young Saudis to be drawn into this holy war. Yet a thirst for adventure is there too. As of 1984, Osama bin Laden is one of them. His presence turns him into a celebrity back home. 1990, deployment of US troops in Saudi Arabia. Their mission, to liberate neighboring Kuwait, which has been occupied by the Iraqi dictator, Saddam Hussein. Bin Laden feels that the presence of U.S. troops in his homeland is an affront to the Muslim world. The holiest sites in Islam, Mecca and Medina, lie in Saudi Arabia. The Russians' withdrawal marks the end of Bin Laden's adventure in Afghanistan. The militant fundamentalist looks for a new sphere of activity. At the time, he even made an offer to Defense Minister Sultan to form an army of volunteers to set against the Iraqis. When the minister and the king rebuffed this notion, Osama bin Laden opted for opposition instead. Starting then, he appears to have thought about ways to take action against Saudi Arabia and its foreign backers, even by force, primarily against the United States. Osama bin Laden 
This hatred towards America culminates in the attacks on September 11, 2001. The Americans strike back. The hunt for bin Laden is on. At first, via CIA squads in Afghanistan. But they're unable to catch bin Laden. Even when US armed forces head into the Hindu Kush region in late 2001, the quarry is nowhere to be found. For years, the Americans presumed that bin Laden is hiding in the mountains of Afghanistan or the tribal regions of Pakistan. The, the search for bin Laden and the decade that, that took, I think at times was a, it, there was a source of an enormous frustration for the intelligence community, if not, if not almost embarrassment, right? How could you have all of these resources, all of these people devoted to this search and turn up so little? Um, there were, um, in terms of the public investment in this, it waned at times, right? There were other things that were happening. There was the invasion in Iraq and that ugly aftermath of the war in Iraq, um, the unraveling of that war. I mean, that diverted not only resources from the search for bin Laden, but diverted the public's attention from the search for bin Laden. Yet since 2005, bin Laden hasn't had to live in mountain villages or caves anymore. In 2004, a Pakistani middleman buys several property lots in a suburb of Abbottabad. He spends $50,000 and applies for a building permit. The client's order calls for a domicile with space for about a dozen residents. In 2005, construction workers erect a house. The neighborhood has been chosen with care. A large portion of the population in Bilal town are retired people, or semi-retired if you like, those who've taken up some occupation after post-retirement. Um, it's, um, it's, it's not an active region. It's not where people get up at 6.30 in the morning and start doing things. It's more like a sleepy place where the day starts at about 9 o'clock. And those who get up earlier than that are the exception, not the rule. Um, it's, it's, um, there's not too much social interaction. Walls enclose the house, not unusual in a culture that shields women from strangers' eyes. Shaukat Kadir knows the situation in Abbottabad. The compound is a large one. It was a very large compound. Uh, but most houses in most uh, villas in, in uh, Bilal town have an equal size of compound. It's about uh, five canals of land in the local language, which comes to about uh, uh, 2,500 square yards of land. That's not too much either. It's a very large compound, but um, for most middle class families in that region, this wouldn't be too large an accommodation. Uh, it's not all that expensive either from uh, that point of view. Bin Laden writes letters, memos and messages in his hideout. He knows he has to be very careful. There is no internet in the house, no mobile phones either. However, he is not completely isolated here either. If you don't forget, he had a lot of time on his hands. So he would write 46-page memos to his lieutenants uh, and then he would, you know, put it on a thumb drive and give it to a courier. The couriers were, you know, they were, they were perfect for bin Laden because they were also his bodyguards. They spoke Arabic because they grew up in Kuwait, but they came from this part of Pakistan, so they spoke the local language. So it was, you know, they were really were able to present themselves as locals because they kind of were. The couriers relay bin Laden's messages, most of which are stored on USB thumb drives to intermediaries. The neighbors only know the two Pakistani brothers, Arshad and Tariq. Nothing about the compound's high-profile resident. Arshad Khan, one of his couriers, systematically shields bin Laden from their view. One of, one of the things that he uh, told, shared with his neighbors was that he had an elder uh, uh, uncle staying with him with his uh, wife and children, and he was not well. So that was the excuse, the other excuse for 
not mixing with people. You know, they were being very, very careful about security. So if a kid would knock a soccer ball or cricket ball over the wall, the bodyguards inside the compound wouldn't return the ball, wouldn't let the kid in. The bodyguard would come out and give somebody 50 rupees to just go away and you know, forget about it. Uh, you, you, they were not letting anybody into the compound. Bin Laden doesn't live all by himself in the compound. He has gathered part of his family here. He always advocated that it's good custom for Muslims to have four wives, which corresponds to common practice, at least among conservative Muslims in Saudi Arabia. Marrying two, three or four women is nothing special if the financial means are there. Two of his four wives are with him in a Abbottabad. Two of his younger children are even born here. Living in a quasi-conspiracy, this can become a real challenge, as bin Laden writes in one of his letters. One of the most important security issues in cities is controlling children by not getting out of the house except for extreme necessity like medical care, and that they do not get to the yard of the house without an adult who will control the volume of their voices. On the compound, there were a dozen kids Bin Laden's kids and then also grandkids. Only very few photos of these younger children exist. The two educated wives, there was sort of a, you know, almost like a classroom and they would teach them and then Bin Laden would come and sort of instruct them about various things. The patriarch visits the classroom almost every day. He shows interest in his children's progress. Bin Laden was very nice to his kids and his family. I mean, you know, people, it's, it's not unusual that people who conduct acts of mass murder have, you know, at least one part of them that is sort of nice. And uh, Bin Laden was certainly a committed father. He would read poetry to his kids. He would kind of instruct them on the Quran. Letters written by his grown children who can't be with him, speak of affection toward their father. We constantly yearn for you and delight in hearing your voice messages, writes one of his daughters. His son Hamza lets him know, my beloved father, I could not imagine the length of this bitter separation. My eyes still remember that last day they saw you. Bin Laden's answer is equally affectionate. By God, I miss you so much. The only thing we're lacking is getting together with you. And yet, in comparison, the terrorist leader knows how good he's faring in his hideout. It, it must have been a bit boring sometimes because he couldn't leave. Uh, but, you know, he was the world's most wanted man. And he's living, he wasn't on the run. You know, he was living in this house for five and a half years. He had his family. Now, most people, when they're on the run, don't take you know, two or three wives and a dozen kids and grandkids with them, right? It's quite unusual. Well, he had them all with him. The search for bin Laden poses a challenge for U.S. investigators at CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. Their work demands a lot of time and even more patience. Well, they always had a dedicated unit of analysts who became essentially target analysts. So their responsibility was to collect and uh, synthesize and analyze all of the information about where he might be and to then send out messages to CIA stations around the world asking them to follow up on one clue or another clue. It was obvious from 2002 forward that there was some kind of courier network serving bin Laden because his tapes came to Al Jazeera and to other outlets by some means. There had to be some handing. So the CIA was searching for those couriers, trying to follow the trail back uh, from when the tapes were dropped. And this was an obvious uh, course of investigation. And uh, along the way, some information started to surface about the important names in this courier network. As of 2010, the Americans keep a man under surveillance who once had connections to Al-Qaeda. 
and apparently provides courier services in Pakistan. They don't know who he works for yet. Al-Qaeda's third in command, Atiya Tala, warns Osama. I previously wrote to you my opinion that we should reduce our correspondence. But bin Laden doesn't want to reduce contact any further. He writes, The facts prove that the American technology and advanced systems cannot capture a Mujahid if he does not make a security violation that will lead them to him. Imagine trying to control a global organization without using the phone or email. I mean, that's how bin Laden was. But he, you know, he had some control because he was able to get these messages out on thumb drives through couriers to people. But it was, you know, you know, it might, he had no idea if the message got through. It might take months for a reply to come. I mean, it was a very, it was like running an organization in like the early 19th century where you would, you know, send somebody physically with a message. It is not without consequences. There are subcommanders who question bin Laden's authority. One of them writes, no doubt that one's distance, due to security situation and other reasons, from reality can weaken his precise vision. Being chased, besieged, and distant is not the best environment for thinking and for forming the right opinion and decision. Even so, he at least manages to stipulate rough guidelines for Al-Qaeda's global activities, and it seems he also manages to have a say regarding operational details in individual cases. However, the fact that he has to communicate exclusively using couriers makes this difficult, which is why he naturally can't engage in planning attacks like those in London in 2005. But it seems as if he was at least still able to influence the broad focus of all these attacks, and he appears to have been well informed about current strategy. Yet the operational leadership no longer considers bin Laden to be a decisive factor. He starts to set other priorities. We need to understand that a huge part of the battle is the media. He's not pleased at all with how the media is portraying him. In the past, I watched some programs about me that relied on incorrect information. If the person does not disclose his history, then the media and the historians will make up some history for him, whether right or wrong. Well, he's, he's obviously a narcissist in many important ways. He sees himself as indispensable to uh, the struggle, to his own faith, to world history. And uh, there's a megalomania in his actions and uh, in his sense of self. Now, he could in person come across as quite uh, retiring and even humble, but in, his, uh, in the choices that he made and in the, the way he uh, defined himself as a leader, he was clearly a narcissist and quite vain as well. He keeps intervening. In late 2004, fierce fighting breaks out in Fallujah, Iraq. U.S. troops temporarily lose the city to Iraqi resistance groups, among them Al-Qaeda in Iraq. In a letter written in 2004, before his time in Abbottabad, bin Laden spurs the insurgents on. Most sincere regards to the free people in the land of Al-Anbar, especially the people in Fallujah, a town that is standing strong and refused to be humiliated and subjected by all of the infidel leaders. It taught them a lesson in consistence and principle and proved to them that the strength of faith is greater than that of planes and cannon shelling. But the leadership of Al-Qaeda in Iraq is hard to keep in check. In 2004, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, a Jordanian who later became the head of al-Qaeda in Iraq, allied himself with Osama bin Laden. He had pledged allegiance to bin Laden, although all the experts knew he didn't have very much in common with al-Qaeda. A native of Jordan, al-Zarqawi, is viewed as extremely vicious and unpredictable. He wanted to remain independent, to fight the battle his way. Al-Zarqawi is not only fighting against American forces. Time and again, Al-Qaeda in Iraq carries out attacks on Iraqi Shiites. As a result, 
primarily it's Muslims who become the victims of Islam's terror. In a letter from 2007, bin Laden cautions against the consequences of these actions. I am afraid that if they continue using techniques such as this, they will spoil and alienate the people. Our brothers are making things worse by opening themselves up to evil and hostility. There was tension there at the, at the outset in an effort um, by bin Laden and, his, and those closest to him to try to exert some influence to sort of check this group in Iraq, to yank its leash from time to time. Um, and ultimately, they couldn't hold on to that leash. That leash was, uh, was broken a couple of years ago, and the Islamic State has emerged as an organization with, with more resources and seen now as a greater menace. America.